I actually have four stories that are fairly short. These stories are ones that my dad told me over the years. A few things to know about my dad. He has always been honest with me and would make it a point to clarify if he was joking with me about something or not. When I asked him if he was kidding about these stories, he would raise his right hand and state on his life that it's the truth. He's in his late 60s now, and these stories have stuck with me. Albeit, some details might be a bit hazy as it's been a few years since I've heard the stories. The titles are loosely based on what he told me before getting into them. Without further ado, here they are. Something in Crescent Lake When my dad was growing up, he lived in Oregon State. He had just finished his senior year of high school and he was job searching. He had a group of friends that he usually would hang out with. One of them had just finished restoring a hydroplane with his dad and his younger brother. Being it was the start of summer, the three of them decided to go test it out on Crescent Lake. They would be gone for two days. However, the only guy that my dad knew came back. Word spread out across the town of the missing father and the younger teenage boy. There was a police investigation and everything. Unfortunately, it got to a point where local police couldn't do anything more. Once it did get to that point, the Navy actually got involved, as they believed it was now a recovery mission in the lake itself. They had a dive team come in to scan the entire bottom. They even brought in a submarine. The lake is very deep. However, nothing was found of any wreckage or bodies. The search was shortly ended after a member of the dive team came back up from the lake only a couple of minutes into his dive. Apparently in the newspaper, it was recorded that the diver said that he refused to go back into the dark depths of the lake because, quote, there was something huge down there, end quote. The man and the boy were never found. Neither was any wreckage from the hydroplane. I've tried multiple times to find any record of this happening, but this happened 50 plus years ago in a small Oregon town. And Google searches don't yield any results, unfortunately. Two Sons Over the Hills My dad eventually moved up to Washington State some years later after moving from Oregon to Idaho. He was living in eastern Washington playing music professionally. There are a lot of very large hills and valleys between them where you will see most of, if not all, the towns and cities that are residing there. On this particular day, my dad was driving with a friend from eastern Washington to western Washington to play a gig. It was midday, and my dad was driving with his friend in the passenger seat. They were laughing and joking around when my dad noticed a large bright light come over the hill in the distance. He described it as being a ball of light that was almost as bright as the sun. It came up over the hill, hovered for maybe about five seconds, and then shot up into the sky and disappeared simultaneously. My dad turned to my friend who was looking out the passenger side window and asked, Did you see that? His friend turned to him and simply asked, What? Which obviously clued my dad off to he hadn't seen it. My dad simply shook his head and said, never mind, and continued driving. If you're in the mountains, make sure to bring a gun. In the 70s, my dad lived in the mountains of Washington State for 10 years. Not so far up that he was completely isolated, but far enough to where he had to make a lengthy drive to the nearest town. He would have friends and girlfriends up there constantly as well. On this particular day, he had two friends and my older stepsister, who was a little girl then. They were all at the cabin with him. They were all around the campfire around dinner time. It was summer, so the sun didn't set until way later in the evening. They were cooking up some steaks over the fire and having a good time. All of a sudden, they heard a gunshot coming up from the mountain, which startled them, but they figured it was hunters. A few minutes later, they started hearing multiple gunshots, but closer from up the mountain, and also what sounded like a group of people hooting and hollering, which is how he put it. The cacophony of noise was getting closer and closer. My dad turned to one of his friends and told him to take Alice, my stepsister, inside and keep her there. He then said, grab my guns and come back out. The friend did as he was told. 
Alice and the friend went inside, and a couple of minutes later, the friend came back out with two six-shooter pistols and a shotgun. My dad took the pistol, the other friend took the shotgun, and the other had the six-shooter. They sat down at the campfire and waited. All the while, they heard people getting closer and closer. A couple of minutes later, a group of men riding horses came screaming down the mountain, shooting their guns in the air. They approached my dad and his friends sitting around the campfire. Without getting up, but showing the men he was armed, my dad turned to them and said, Evening, gentlemen. Look, this can go one of two ways. We can fly lead to one another and see who dies first, or we can sit down and have some beer and a nice campfire cooked steak. There were five total on horseback, with what my dad described as a troublemaking armory. My dad only counted three pistols, a couple of rifles, and a shotgun, but he didn't know what could have been in the horse satchels. The group of men eyed them over while both sides were brandishing weapons until one finally hopped off their horse, holstered his pistol, and simply said, Looks like a good time. The rest followed suit, and they all calmed down and had dinner together. My dad took my stepsister into town to grab dinner after the men left. He describes that as the scariest moment of his life, but he had to stay firm and strong not only because his friends wouldn't, but also to protect his daughter. What stays up in the dance hall loft? In the 80s, my dad had a gig where he would play at a dance hall in western Washington every weekend. Things were fine for the first couple of weeks with no incident. They would show up, grab their gear from the loft, set up for the night, and then put everything back up there after the show. It's important to note that this dance hall was basically out in the middle of the woods of western Washington. It's since been torn down, though. Anyways, one weekend, my dad and a couple of bandmates got there early to set up as usual. When they walked in, they noticed that the kitchen that was on the other side of the building, opposite of the stage and the loft, was completely torn asunder. Plates and glasses smashed, pots and pans everywhere, food and liquids all over the floor and counters. They all thought that the place must have gotten broken into somehow and was robbed. My dad and one of the bandmates went up to the loft to check on their gear, while another bandmate went to a payphone to call the owner. All of their gear was still there. The owner showed up a while later and canceled the show that night to help get the place cleaned up. The next weekend rolls around, and as usual, the band gets there early to set up. They walked in, and the same thing happened. The kitchen was an absolute mess, rinse and repeat from the week before. My dad was a little annoyed because now he was losing money by not working. He suggested that they try to get to the bottom of it. Now, I want to pause for just a minute here to explain the layout of this building, and it's kind of important for the unfolding events. The main entrance was on the long side of the building at the front. A few windows out front as well, with a long driveway that led up to the parking. On the inside, you would immediately be on the dance floor with the stage and the steep steps to the loft on the right-hand side, and the kitchen with a little sitting area to the left. In the loft, there was a door that was up on its level, about 20 to 25 feet off the ground on the back of the building. It faced the woods, and it looked just like the front door to any house. This was for a pulley system above the door so large, heavy things could be hoisted up there without having to use the very steep incline of the stairs that led up. Back on track now, they decided to split up and check the building. A couple of guys, including my dad, went to the kitchen to look around, and then outside with a couple of others that went up to the loft. About five minutes after my dad started looking around the kitchen to see if anything was taken, he heard one of his bandmates scream from up in the loft, followed by a loud crash and a couple of loud bangs. My dad and the guy he was with ran over to the stairs. Once they got up there, the bandmate they heard scream appeared to be fine, besides picking himself up off the floor, and he was ghost white. The door to the outside was wide open, and it smelled like a skunk had just sprayed everything up there. The next thing they noticed was that there was a secondary normal-sized door that was rather close to the one that leads outside, and it was open. This was a rather good-sized closet that ran the width of the building, which the stage faced away from, and they didn't even know it was there. 
They looked down from the door outside and saw that thin birch trees that made up the forest surrounding the hall had been broken in a straight path for some distance before stopping. The owner, who had been searching on the outside, was also standing at the bottom of the door, pale ghost white like my dad's bandmate was. They finally asked what the hell happened, and all they could say was that something big and hairy just jumped down from the loft door and ran through the trees. It almost jumped on top of the owner, and it was huge. The collective band then took turns looking into the closet space behind that secondary door. My dad described it as a nest with old bed sheets and grass, and the smell was horrible. Probably excrement from inside. They also saw ripped open plastic bags from the kitchen that had previously contained food items, as well as tin cans that were just seemingly torn open. Whatever it was that the two guys saw that day, in broad daylight, scared them to the point to where the hall was closed down for the next month. My dad liked to end the story with this. The creepiest part to me, even though I didn't see the thing, is that we would play so loud we wouldn't have heard anything. And the place smelled like booze so often, and the place was so big that we didn't smell anything either. It could have just been up there watching people from the darkness of the loft, and no one would have been any of the wiser. Those are my creepy stories my dad has told me over the years. I remember that I asked him about those stories a couple years back, and he still stands by them. He retold me the loft one because it was my favorite to hear as a teen when he first told me. My dad has lived a pretty crazy life, and I suppose that comes with some crazy experiences.